Okay, here we go. Episode 14 of The Drop in the house. Coming in <laughs> hot as usual. MK and I are back on the bi-weekly schedule. We have a fantastic guest with us today. MK and I are very excited to be talking to this gentleman in a few minutes. We have been following his work for years. Uh, incredible stuff. Our first sculptor of the series. Yeah, first MK. sculptor, yeah. Yeah, it's very cool. That. I love that we are bringing in all different genres and all different mediums. Our kids are uh, giving us some cool feedback on all the different kinds of things that they've been seeing over the past 13 weeks. Yep. Um, exposing them to all different kinds of stuff. Really interesting, innovative, creative minds. Uh, just great stuff. That, and this, uh, this guest is no different. In fact, probably one of the most unique artists yeah, we definitely. had on yeah definitely yeah. so we're gonna we're gonna get into that uh it is july 17th mk we are in the middle of summer break i know i know it's crazy What's going on? it's flying by i'm already hearing stuff about september coming up right uh i know we For have our you, big announcement coming up soon about yes. how the school year is going to go in september so we're waiting yes. on that yeah here in new york we have uh, what's called the regents which is a, uh, an elected body, a governing body for our education system statewide. And they are in the midst of planning guidelines and recommendations for us. Uh, and our governor is going to be uh, making an announcement in a couple of weeks about how he thinks we should proceed. Uh, MK and I have our fingers crossed that we are going to get in physically at some point. It doesn't. I think I we're going to be in. I think we're going to be in physically. I think that, but I think yeah. we're going to, it's going to be staggered where we're not going to have yeah. our full group that's what i'm thinking right right we're waiting, fact, on, our, waiting on that yeah. announcement and then we're waiting on that announcement to once again change probably three oh, or four course. times yeah. in the next absolutely four weeks. of course because that's how yeah. everything's been going but actually in a few minutes we're going to get to our guest who is also familiar with education because he has taught at the college level and we're going to ask him a couple of things about that in a few minutes too um but uh i am impressed mk by the way with uh with your home garden my home garden, home garden is, is blowing thri- up, my friend. Thriving right now. It is absolutely thriving. The posts on Instagram, you have me very inspired. Uh, oh, is I'm, it glad. Too, is I'm glad. It, is it too late in the season for me to start anything? Am I just like... I don't know. My mom. Can I just is, chalk it up? My mom is just plant it and see how it grows. I mean, yeah. if okay. you plant something now, I mean, it's July, but I mean, you'll get something by, you know, the, the summer goes pretty late here. You know, you'll yeah. still get some, even if you plant like a tomato, not, not from seed, but I'm saying if you buy yes. like a plant and you'll get some fruit from it. Probably, yeah. Probably, that's what so. I was, that's what I was thinking. Cause yeah, my the girls garden, are, uh, garden my girls thriving. are very envious. Every time I show them your post, they're like, wow, look at Mike's garden. It's awesome. My tomatoes though, it's because I stake them so high. You know what I mean? Like, right. like some people use cages and some people let them crawl, but like I always grew them on stakes. So like right. they, they're, they only grow up. So they're right now they're they're gigantic they're yes, probably like nine impressive. nine feet tall but like i said the other day when we had that nor'easter come through they came down like trees so, yeah. yeah so it's, it's wow. good so there's pluses and there's minuses so. there is there is. yeah the uh, garden is good that's good that's good stuff before we get to our guests i just want to give a shout out to uh lauren labella from empire state studios the tattoo studio here in amityville uh hooked me up with some beautiful work this past week while we were off a uh, long time in the making. I felt very unbalanced, MK, with my right hand yeah, unfinished. Yeah. My left hand was done five years ago by my buddy Luke Westman, and I've been itching to get something done again. And was supposed to be back in April, and then this whole thing happened. And it was a while for back. you since your last. It was tattoo. a long, yeah. It was a long itch. Too so long. I got too that. long. Yes, very, very too long. I feel complete now. Uh, but big thanks to Lawrence. You did a beautiful job. Uh, very talented. I told her I would be working with her again definitely in the future because she's uh she's phenomenal she's a yeah, she graduate nice. of uh graduate of savannah college of art and design actually oh nice a degree in painting uh, a lot of our students have gotten acceptances to to scad and, and yep. good with scholarship offers and it's a great program so if you're looking into a uh, a good painting program scad is one of them for sure yeah uh and i have miraculously avoided a personal trip to the er these past two weeks despite the 12 foot trampoline that now exists in my backyard. I don't know what you were thinking with that. <laughs> I don't know either. I, I, I just, I lost all control, I think. And I was yeah. just, I gave in, I gave in. They were begging, they were begging, they were begging. And I was like, oh, yeah. And then Michelle was like, just let's get one. I was like, 
Uh, Ooh, and that, for, for Michelle to say that, I think that's like, wow, I can't believe that. Because I figured was, like- I think she was more nervous about me getting injured your, your the ment- kids, for uh, sure. Or your mental health, having the kids in the house all summer long yes, with nothing I to do. I think trying to get them So let's get, get them, them a trampoline streets. and- uh, let's, yeah. Yes, let's get them something that could potentially kill their father and pay for their college tuition after he's gone. Maybe that's a strategy. I all think right. that was the strategy. I'm pretty sure. I, I sure. could see that. Yeah. We'll, we'll see, though. Uh, our guest today is one Mr. Michael Murphy, based out of Brooklyn, New York. Michael, thank you for joining us, my friend. How are we doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Mm. Thanks for following the work. It means a lot oh. to me. Oh, we love oh, it. Absolutely. It's, yeah, we absolutely love it. Um, Michael's background Thanks. is in sculpture. Uh, and as we mentioned at the beginning of the program, our first sculptor here on the program, um, he is originally from Ohio. Is that right, Michael? Yeah, I was born in Ohio, and um, from there I went to Chicago to do graduate study. Okay, so you did Chicago uh, for six you, years. You did go to college in Ohio, also, correct? Yeah, I went to Kent State. Kent nice. State, okay. Because yeah, we we just wanted to get a little bit of your background. Now, let me ask you, Michael, going back earlier than that, at what point for you, starting right from the beginning, when did you know that? being an artist was something you wanted to do as a profession did it hit earlier than college no um i actually didn't know art existed until college um, oh wow really? grew up in a small town um you know the biggest thing in the town that i grew up in was uh murder actually and and crime oh, it had wow. the highest, yeah it had the highest murder rate in the country what part um, of ohio was that youngstown oh, okay. okay it was like I think the nickname was Murder City. It had wow. the most most wow. murder in the entire country. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, but I grew up with a, a very limited cultural back uh, cultural knowledge. Um, you know, never went to museums. Never didn't even know that art galleries were a thing um, until I went to college. And then I, you know, took a sculpture class, and I was like, "Holy cow! This is this is what I'm supposed to be doing." You know, I, I made things my entire life, but you know. Um, didn't realize that there was actually a career where I could um, make things that, you know, support myself right. doing stuff. So. Right. Were yeah. you creative younger as a kid? Like, did you have an outlet, a creative outlet of any type? Yeah, my dad was a, a construction worker. So, you know, the garage was filled with tools, um, mm-hmm. at least we could imagine. So as a kid, like those were my toys. So yeah. I was always, always making things. Um, I would make toys you know, build tree houses and, wow. you know, make, make like a go-kart, you know, yeah. um, just weird toys. And it's I probably had an that. effect on who you became as an artist for sure though. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. 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 You know, wow. I mean, I was basically like locked in a room with a bunch of tools as a child, you know, <laughs> um, and, th- and this is what happens. You know? Yeah. <laughs> no, it pay, yeah. pays off. Yeah. That's for sure. But I think that it, I think yeah. that it, you know, when we start pulling up your work and showing everybody work, I think you will see how it, absolutely informed the direction that you took and why sculpture I think was such a natural outlet for you and the type of sculpture particularly because you've discussed with us you know we talked to Michael earlier in the week on Tuesday uh, during the pre-check and he was telling us about like you've actually had to create for lack of a better term tools to help in your process of putting things together right yeah yeah we make a lot of our own tools for sure yeah yeah, so I, I would think that that background with you having access to those tools as a kid, whether consciously or not, definitely must have informed you going ahead in what you were doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, my construction background comes in, you know, I, as what, when I was an undergraduate, I was a construction, a construction worker. I had a little construction company. And that, um, that background and that knowledge really... Um, comes in handy when I'm doing like large scale installations in, right. you know, a construction environment. Um, yeah. You know, and I have to interface with architects and engineers and all that all the time. Um, yeah. And I speak their language, which is really useful. Yeah, right, for sure. Right. And that's, it's interesting because that's one thing that I've always heard, you know, I have an uncle who is an architect and the, the thing I always hear about, there's always, there always seems to be a gap between what the architect sees and what the contractor wants to actually make. That sometimes architects are a little bit too pie in the sky and like come up with these concepts and the contract is like, I can't make that happen. There's no way I'm going to make that happen. So like for you, I can see how having that creative background and that 
that l labor background really melds perfectly for what you're doing. Yep. Yep. It makes it a lot easier for right. sure. Right. And, and if you walk onto a construction site and you don't know what you're talking about, it's usually met with um, a little bit of hostility. Yeah. So I'm sure. <laughs> I'm you know, sure. Smooth, smooth things out a little bit when you're able to communicate with people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're not familiar with Michael's work, it is so unique and so outstandingly produced. Like it is so, so just high caliber and beyond what the normal person could come up with. It's just absolutely. Now, Michael, how, yeah, would, you, how would you describe it? If, if I was to say, you know, sculpture, MK and I were talking about it during the week after we spoke with you, and we were like, you know, artists don't like to be technically categorized all the time or pigeonholed. But if you had to explain the type of sculpture that you do, is there a name for it? Uh, well, I refer to my work as perceptual art because um, the main emphasis is on the viewer's perception. Um, mm -hmm. What you see in front of you transforms and changes. Um, right. Pe depending on the way that you the way that you look at it, so the way that you perceive it um, is something that that, that changes uh, upon closer inspection. Right. Um, I went into sculpture because when I when I started studying uh, fine art, sculpture was this kind of melting pot. Um, it was the melting pot of all the of all the media. Um, right. Whenever something wasn't a painting, it wasn't a drawing, it wasn't a print it kind of just got lumped into sculpture and that really yeah. that that really appealed to me because um i like doing new things i don't like you'll know, look at my portfolio and there's not a lot of stuff that's like just like the the other work um, no yeah it definitely pushes the boundaries it's creative it's yeah oh yeah 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 it's not and, like anybody else's work and that's something that we were talked about when on uh wednesday after we spoke right time we're like who else yeah. is doing stuff like this and it Oh, I don't see anybody don't, don't. doing anything like yeah. this. No, no. Good. Yeah, <laughs> Good. See, yeah you're right. <laughs> I see other people making my work, um, ad agencies especially. Um, right. They don't, yeah. there's, you know, when I first started doing this, you didn't do someone else's work. That wasn't cool. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're gonna do something creative, you have to have the creative part involved in there and you have to come up with your own concept, your own ideas and your own technique. Right. And that's how I developed. Um, and now, uh, with this sharing culture that we're in, um, you know, it's the the curator, the aggregator that that gets the credit for sharing things. Um, yeah. And there's not much emphasis on the actual creator or the creation of it. So a lot of my work, you know, I have. 20 messages I was just looking at, you know, people asking me like, what software do you use? You know, how do you do this? Can you walk me through this step by step, how I make your work? And I'm like, yeah. no, I know. you know, that's not how this works, you know? Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to navigate that as, as times change. Are you, are you cautious to what you post on social media? I was just, of that? Gonna, I was just thinking that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't post any trade secrets. Yeah. Essentially, I, yeah. I, I try to only publish the finished results. Um, you guys say you love process. I love process too. Um, you know, I, I love making things. I love the process. Um, yeah. Like right now, I'm making this this rubber mold, and the entire thing is just so beautiful. I'm trying to figure out like what, how I can share it. You know, how I can capture it and share it with people. But I'm like right. every single step of the way it's so beautiful you know i'd have to have right. like cameras in my eyes you know to <laughs> yeah, document yeah. It properly yeah but but for you know, it's like, a like it's like a double-edged sword the engine i mean your work works so well for social media because it has that wow factor and i'm sure your work gets shared on many you know art sharing um pages and accounts and stuff like that is constantly pushed out uh by other yeah. people and it's like like you said it's it's not really about the artist. It's about the person sharing it. But, you know, I would feel for you as like, as an artist that social media is important. It's, it's a way to get your work out. But for somebody like you, where, you know, your work is truly unique, you want to be protective of your processes and, you know, yeah. keeping your value up and your demand up by being the only person that really does that and can do that. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Ideally. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I, I try not to reveal any of the trade secrets and you know I've um, 
I have revealed those trade secrets and I've seen the the outcome of doing so and it's, it's yeah. not good. Um, it ends so up it out. ends up burning you, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 And and you know, like there's like Dell just put out a commercial and you know, everybody's messaging me like, Oh my gosh, I just saw your Dell commercial. I'm like, wait a minute, I didn't do a Dell <laughs> Dell commercial, let me check it out. And I look at it, you know, and it, it's my it's my my entire format. <laughs> Hear that? Yeah. It's my <laughs> those are the giant trucks I was talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, the and the, the T V commercial is, is my format for how I put together images. Um, it's my camera moves exactly. You know, yeah. the, the first three seconds, I'm like, oh, that's no, they're not doing that, are they? They're do oh, they're doing it. You know, like oh, jeez. Wow. Um, and it's like to a T. Because um, what I do is really specific, and when I see someone else do it, I'm like, hey, you know, that's that's kind of I feel territorial. Yeah. You know, and, and at times I used to get like kind of hostile about it. And, oh, I can you know, imagine. Yeah. And now my wife, she gets really angry too when she sees it, and I'm like. <laughs> I'm like it's okay it's okay you know it's it's a good yeah. thing you know we'll just we'll just own it you know and we'll be the originator of of this whole thing and we'll let other people you know do it too i guess that the the good thing about it i guess the flattering thing is about it is that when people do see that style they they associate it directly with you first you know i mean yes. it's that got to be you know bittersweet because obviously somebody's taking your you know you really your ideas to 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 do this but i mean i guess it is good in the sense that when somebody does see that they know that it should be you at least but you know? at the same but at the same time i would think michael that like you said like somebody says hey i saw your commercial and you're like oh crap i hope it doesn't suck yeah because right. it still right. has your quote-unquote look to it well the bad thing would be if they did it better than i do um that would, <laughs> that would be the bad part <laughs> you know i mean there's two things like one um you know i've got people basically taking contracts that i feel like should have been mine you know like i should have done a dell commercial they saw my work they they stole all of my stuff and right. used you it and applied it applied it to their thing um and <laughs> you know there's nothing i can do about it um but yeah. they should have hired me and a lot of companies contact me and they're like you know we, we were gonna get someone else to do this but we thought you know no that's not right we should have the artist yeah who, right you know well, that's, originated yeah that's good uh, business yeah. Exactly. And I'm very thankful when, when clients uh, come at it with that type of attitude. But a lot of times people don't. And they just go ahead and, and have it made. Um, wow. Because it's not, impo it's not impossible to figure out. I mean, you know, you know, once someone else creates the product, you can look at it and recreate it. Uh, right. there's, you know, there's ways to do it. But the other thing is um, it oversaturates the market with my type of work. Right. Um, you know, like I, I get comments sometimes on social media, like, when are people going to stop making artwork like this? And I'm really? like, I'm like, well, this is how I talk. Uh, yeah. You know, this is this is how I'm communicating to the world. This is this language that I've developed. Like, it's not it's not a one liner. You know, I'm not yeah. gonna do it once or twice and then move on to something else. Like, this is this language that I've created and this way of communicating. And it's, it's how you. I talk. It's yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, and if people look back at your work too, from like you know years ago. There's a growth. There's a there's a, a development to where you got today, and way the way that your work looks now. So, you know what you're doing right now. You know, it's not going to be what you're doing in a couple of years from now. It's gonna your language is going to continue to evolve. The way that you speak artistically is going to be continue to evolve. Michael is not stagnant in his approach. Like he's right. he's obviously a lifelong learner of his medium. He's yeah. constantly looking to push the boundaries, like we've said, or push the envelope of what can be done with this material, what can be done with this concept, how we, you know, how can he uh, bring a different light to it, a different look, how, like you said, how he evolves his language and tells a different story or tells something that's, you know, not the same from five years ago, I think. Michael, have you ever thought of any kind of legal recourse for these kinds of things? Have you contacted anybody or even like, do you have a gallery and maybe the gallery can step in for you? How do they feel about it? No, I don't have a gallery. Um, well, when you, what is it? It's a, it's a patent. Um, I got, I got an email from, I think it was Northwestern university about my infringement on their patent. And they sent me a copy of their patent and I looked at it and I'm like, Whoa, this is my multi-directional thing that I do like right. to a T I read over the patent, look at the, look at the technical drawings. I'm like, this is it, you know? And, um, they wanted financial, uh, they wanted payment 
for all of the projects that I've done using that technique. Wow. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. So I looked back, I looked at the date on the patent. And I'm like, wait a minute, I've got work just like this that predates their patent. Mm-hmm. Like I, I actually invented it before they got their patent, before they invented it. And I responded to them with that. And I said, I, you know, sorry, but you, I have prior art. I have artwork that, um, you know. Uh, Predates that whole thing. Yeah. yeah. So they yeah, have pat- the patent on the concept. Is that basically what it is? The concept? The technique. The, that, the, the technique. multidirectional technique. You know? That's yeah. crazy um, that you could even patent that. You know what I mean? Well, you can because it's very technical and, and you can create technical drawings that explain step by step how to achieve it. Right? Yeah. And if, that, if that's the case, you can patent it. Oh, wow. Which this brought to light to me the fact that I could have been patenting all of my <laughs> techniques. Yeah. But wow. you have to patent it within one year of creating it. So there, okay. there, wow. there are a number of things that you'll see in my portfolio that are, that are totally new. They're in, inventions. Um, mm-hmm. And I could have patented them. Um, and I have, I have, I have names for each of the techniques, you know, mm. uh, based on, on what it is, you know, um, some of them are referred to as expanded graphics because they're, they're graphics that are expanded literally yeah, right. um, in three dimensional space, uh, the 3d halftone, like there was no such thing as a three dimensional halftone drawing, yeah. um, yeah. didn't exist. And I didn't know that I could have patented those. I could have patented them wow. and then I could have did what Northwestern university is doing go after people who are copying the work right right which is not not really my style you know right. I, I, i'd rather be in the studio than in a uh, lawyer yeah office exactly or yeah. Courtroom. i would imagine that's amazing also, though it, it takes an entire team to do that too though like how do you have time to scour the internet for every little thing that happens that quote you know could look like your stuff or might look like your stuff right. like like you said you would rather be just creating and right. not worrying about that that's well mine wow. You know, some of my stuff has over 100 million views, so it would come to people's attention. If, you know, if I'm yeah, it's, on it's out there. Patents. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm, you know, you'll see my stuff on primetime TV sometimes. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so wow. you know, it's hard to keep it a secret. But wow. yeah, yeah, I let them know, and they just disappeared. They didn't even <laughs> say thank you or sorry or anything. They just ghosted me after I once I, they wow. found out that they weren't going to get any money from you or anything like yeah. that. It's it. Yeah. yeah. That's well, they crazy. asked me for the, they asked me for the proof. So I'm, I'm like on the phone with my mom. I'm like, Mom, remember that thing I made like in '97? <laughs> like, I, I need to go <laughs> go in the attic and find yeah. it because <laughs> she won't let me throw anything away. I'm always like, you know, I'm always oh, cleaning the house and throwing everything away. And she's like, No, you know. <laughs> oh, that's funny because we've spoken yeah, so to artists the last through. couple of weeks. They're like, We don't throw anything away, and you're yeah, like the that's... opposite. It's your mom that's saving yeah. everything. That's so funny. I throw everything away. That's well, great. You know, when, you, when you make sculpture, if you don't throw stuff away or, or sell it or give it away, you end up with, you're not able to room, you're not able to move. You, know, you become you a have, hoarder then. <laughs> yeah. It, well, my, fa- my father was a hoarder and I'm like, oh, I can't do that. You know, so I'm like, I'm, I'm like, mom, I clean and throw everything away, you know. Yeah, that's but, funny. Uh, but yeah. then again, if your dad wasn't a hoarder, you may not have had all those tools at your disposal in the garage either. So that's true. That's <laughs> that true. that yeah. could have paid off too. Um, so Michael, let me ask you, let's go back a little bit. So you're in college, you're, you're, you're addicted to sculpture. Basically now you like, you find this light that goes on. Where does this perceptual art come into play? Like how do you transition? What did you discover something specific was it like a specific artist, a movement? What all of a sudden got your attention? Well, my very first uh, sculpture class, I, I took with a guy named Brinsley Storrell. He's this English sculptor. Um, he was my professor for my first sculpture class. And I saw him creating these amazing things and teaching classes and doing these large scale public uh, sculptures. And I'm like, wow, this guy's got it down, you know? Um, it's amazing. And he, uh, we hit it off right away and he asked me to come work with them, you know, to rebuild his old barn. He had this 200 year old barn that we rebuilt and turned into like a museum and a sculpture studio and all that. Um, And we ended up working together for five years and I ended up becoming his fabricator um, essentially and making his artworks for him. And that was when I like, I was like, God, this guy's got it down. You know, he's got these amazing gardens at home, this like gorgeous studio and like all these like cool, things all over sprinkled all over inside of his life and i was like that, that that's it that's incredible you know and the um the perceptual part uh 
actually the first thing I ever made. Um, the first time I was given a, a lump of clay, uh, I made one of the multi-directional sculptures. And that's the oh, one wow. that, that devoided those people's patent. Um, oh. That was the, the first thing I ever did. And um, That's amazing. Yeah, it was cool. Um, it was really low tech, you know, and kind of kind of ugly. <laughs> but, you know, still got it, and it got me out of trouble. Um, I'm yeah. really glad mom saved it. But uh, <laughs> so that's where that started. That was literally the first thing I ever made. And then um, I was, at the time I was studying at Kent State University, digital video or video started to become digitized. You know, yeah. the, the first video I ever edited, I was like cutting VHS tapes and gluing them together. <laughs> you know, that was video editing when it first started. And then, you know, iMovie came out and they started using digital cameras. And I started getting really um, into projection work. I started doing a lot of uh, projection where I would build sculptural surfaces and then mm. I would project photographs onto them. Okay. And I noticed that when you moved around, when you project an image onto a three-dimensional surface and you move around, because the, the surface is not flat, the image looks like it's moving. And I, I thought it was like this kind of animation that would happen. And there was this really interesting effect called parallax, you know, the, the way that things appear to move in relationship to one another because the viewer's moving. Um, and I really fell in love with that. So I started making all these um, custom projection screens that would really amp up that, that parallax effect. Yeah. And I realized that if you put your, your eye right where the projector was, everything would flatten out and you wouldn't see the three dimensional properties huh. of that whole scenario right. and that's where I, I was like that's where i started rendering flat images in three-dimensional space mm, which wow. is in a nutshell what i do right now um you know i just you know they used to be that deep the sculptural projection screens and now they're 20 feet deep you know wow, one of them's wow. 80 80 feet deep um so you know and the more, <laughs> The more parts there are, the, the more of that parallax stuff is that happens. And um, it's just really kind of exciting, the parallax, yeah, parallax yeah. stuff is. Well, that's, that's interesting. Just, wow. MK, alien or yeah, not? Again, alien, yeah. It's just like, wow. <laughs> like the, the thought process that just is But it makes sense thing. now, though. It does. Now that he said, does. Now you say that with the, the um, projection on the three-dimensional surface, you could see how that, you know, you know, was the starting point or kind of, but it's, you know. but it sounds like it's truly a discovery process for you, Michael. Like you were just like kind of playing around with whatever techniques were available. And then the light bulb just went on and you're like, Oh, Hey. And then, and then how did you know the term and not like, did you research the term for that? Like, how did you come up with that? Uh, it was more like I made backwards engineered. Um, it was more like I was making the work and I'm like, what is this? You know, what did I just do? Like, what is this, you know, like parallax? Like, I, I didn't know what that was, you know. Mm. And, um, you know, all, all the terms surrounding the work, um, I sort of had to look up, you know, the terminology and figure out, like, the mechanics of what's actually happening. Like, right. when I look at this, why, why is that exciting to me? Because it's important for me to understand why it, you know, stimulates me because, it's going to stimulate viewers and I want to stimulate viewers. So I want to like really focus on that, and ramp it up. Right. Um, for example, if you have an image and you break it up into two pieces, it's not very exciting, but if you break it up into a hundred, it gets, starts to get exciting. Well, why is right. that? You know, yeah, like, right. and, and that's the type of stuff that I'm trying to understand and translate. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's like, it's what, a, yeah, what point does it, yeah, you're right. Like if two, it, two pieces and you break it the further you break it up i feel like the more people get amazed by it you know the more moving yeah. parts the more pieces you know that you know it has just, that, because that i think factor. it's because mk i think it's something that it's not commonly seen either right like we've yeah. said it like right. michael's work is so unique and so different and it's not something you see on an everyday basis even in the art world like other artists or always, you know, looking at what other people are doing and saying, oh, how's they, how are they doing that? Or how are they doing that? Like, I can just imagine how many other artists that follow Michael's work and are entranced by his ability to do what he does because they can't wrap their head around that either. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that's, that's that where, and yeah. yeah. And, and, for, and for the the fact that he's able to make it happen, like he doesn't just visualize it he actually produces it and figures out a way to do that. I yeah, think yeah. That's, that's the hard part. Yeah. 
I would and, think so. But is now, Michael, is there is there ever a concept that you've come up with that you have never been able to pull off? Uh, there are some that um, that I haven't done yet. Mm. Um, that I'm that I'm excited to to start working on. Um, you know, like a lot of the stuff that I'm doing now, like I wasn't able to do previously because the technology didn't exist. Um, you know, like right now I'm making a rubber mold and and eighty percent of it's three D printed. Yeah. You know, I'm designing this 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 mold on the computer and then I'm fabricating the parts and three D printing them. And you know, I was realizing it yesterday. I'm like, man, I, this is like a dream, like to have this machine, like to manufacture all these crazy parts for me that I would have had to like build by hand in the past. Right. Um, Saves a lot of time. It, yeah, it's incredible. Like, you know, um, like the first multidimensional sculpture I made was out of clay, you know, and then this one's 3D printed and, and I'm like thinking about like turning it into a puzzle. Um, oh, that's interesting. You know. Now that yeah, is, that piece that you're doing is your first, you said it's your first quote unquote product? Yeah, this is um, gonna be a product that we're releasing next week. It's That's um, awesome. It's the Air Jordan 1 and the, the Jumpman logo. And this one works from four different directions, as you can wow. see. Um, and this is this is the prototype, um, and that's why it comes apart. Um, right. I was kicking around the idea of it being a, you know, a 3D puzzle, like all the, all the pieces come apart. But, you know, I wouldn't have been able to I couldn't have created something like this 10 years ago. No. Um, but now with, with all the technology, it's incredible. I'm able to, to do, you know, new things. Whenever the technology changes, I'm able to create, um, you know, the work changes whenever yeah. I get a new piece, of, new piece of tech. You know, I get a new camera, my videos get better. Um, right. yeah. yeah. It's, it's like an, ev it's, it's a constant evolution of your stuff. I think that's why, yeah it remains so not just exciting MK, but timely. Like it speaks yeah. to the time that it's made. Like, yeah, like, definitely. definitely. Right. Cause, yeah. cause you, we were just, we were discussing it before Michael logged on, you know, MK and I got on a little bit earlier and, and MK was saying, no, he was looking back Michael on your Instagram and how, and he had mentioned it just earlier, how he sees how the stuff has changed over time. But, what we don't take into account was what was available to make that at that specific time. Right. Yeah. And what's and, awesome is that you're, you embrace the technology and you recognize that it could push your art forward, you know, and you, yes. you take, you take advantage of it to really to its fullest. I mean, the 3d printing, I'm sure the, the software that goes into designing a lot of the stuff now it's, it's, you know, you know, you embrace it and you, you either learn it, you find people that could assist and, you know, it's a, really, it's, it's amazing. How does that work for you, Michael? Do you have to invent algorithms and things that are just specific to what you want to create? Or can you just like, can I just Google like, I don't know, algorithm for three dimensional sculpture? How does that work? No, um, there's a bit of a gap um, between the, the, like I create 3D models of the things and then I fabricate them. And there's kind of a, a gap uh, in mm -hmm. between those two, um, right. between, the, the digital and the real life. And that's kind of what I am. I'm the bridge between those two, those mm. two things. Um, yeah. I, I don't create custom algorithms. I have um, had employees working for me who wrote some algorithms that, that, you know, sped some parts of the process up, but the amount of time it took to create the algorithm, I could have done it five times already, <laughs> you know, wow. manually. Uh, a, yeah. lot, a lot of our stuff, it's literally like done by hand, even though we're, we're doing it on the computer, like we're measuring every string one at a time right. by hand on the computer and then cataloging it, a lot of spreadsheets. Um, you wouldn't believe how many spreadsheets like one of our sculptures like uh, uses. It's, yeah. it's, it's ridiculous. Wow. Um, everything we can to speed stuff up, but it's still made by hand. Um, no real algorithms, you know, and that's, that's the messages I get. Like what software are you using to do this? Well, I'm yeah. using the, the dumbest software you can imagine. I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> like, cause it's like so simple, yeah. you know, everybody, everybody will do it. Right. Um, but yeah. Yeah. But no, it, yes. MK, I think that it's a great message for some of our kids who have, like you said, who have in the past shied away from embracing technology as part of their process. I know a yeah. lot of our kids, you know, it's either all or nothing. Either they want to go into like graphic design and just do the computer or they want to be painters full time and not touch a computer. Um, but for someone well, like I, Michael to come on and like show that bridge, 
how, yeah, it's, how it's just another tool to get to an end. Well, I like what, exactly. Michael, I like what you said when we first came on, you were saying that, you know, if it's not drawing, if it's not painting, it's somehow lumped into sculpture. And when I look at your work, it, it is sculpture, it's, it's installation art, but like, like the suspended half tones, like, why is that not a drawing? I, to me, I almost consider that more a drawing than I would a, a sculpture. And, you know, in some cases, I would look at your pieces and say, well, those are paintings, or maybe, you know, they're, they're almost, sculpture is just half of what your work is, I would say. I agree. Um, you know, it, I'm making images, which yeah. is not, not typically what a sculptor does. Yeah. Um, but, but sculpture, you know, these things, they're all just, these, these terms are just for the sake of communication. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, I make, I make sculpture because it's just, if I try to explain exactly what I do to somebody, then I'm just too many words. When we say that it's sculpture, we know it's going to be three dimensional in some way. So exactly. it exactly. works. If it has three dimensions, it's sculpture. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's why it's this giant melting pot. You yeah. Know, anything that, that's not flat. You know, it's a sculpture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is that part of the appeal for you, Michael, to make this kind of work that it can't really be categorized that you're kind of like morphing between different genres and different categories? Is that, is there a sort of appeal to that for you? Yeah, I like that. Um, you know, I, uh, I like my work. So me liking it is something is really important. Um, right. The, the main motivation for me is the experience that's created for people when they interact with the work, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's what's really important to me. Um, you know, like, is it, what's the content? Is it something that, that the audience is, is interested in, can engage with? Um, is it relevant? You know, it's not just pictures of my mom, you know, right. which right. no one else would be able to relate to. So the viewer's experience is really the, the main thing for me. And what I'm making is like, um, like, like you said, you can track it back. You can see the early stuff that I did. Um, uh, it's just, I'm, I'm just doing the same thing. I'm just doing one thing. It's just evolving as I, as I work on it. So when, when I come up with a new idea, I'm like, is that an evolution or am I going backwards? You know, sometimes it's okay to go backwards if you didn't, you know, do something perfectly the last yeah. time. You can right. revisit it and refine it, which is a lot of what I do. But I'm trying to you know, push the envelope and keep, keep the, this progression moving forward. So yeah. That I'm, you know, so that it's constantly evolving. So how much yeah. input yeah. does a client have when they come to you with an idea? Do you say, okay, we can't do that. Or, or do you say something like, let me show you what's possible. It varies. Um, you know, I had a client yesterday who contacted me. Well, see, like what I do is like pretty simple. Um, in, in a nutshell, like, uh, you know, two images. Right. It's like, uh, it's like elevator talk, you know, and that's often what I tell clients. I'm like, describe this whole project to me in two words. You know, those are our two, those are our two illusions. Right. Um, it, but it varies. Like sometimes a client, like client yesterday contacted me and they already had the whole concept all put together. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's because my formula is pretty simple and you can plug anything into it. Um, right. Like I could make a sculpture about any topic you want. And it could have this whole narrative inside of it. You know, it could have two like main impactful points of view, and then it could explode and become a mural. Um, right. You can plug anything into that. Um, mm. Like, I work with a lot of brands. Um, I try to work with the most iconic brands. I you know I, I can. Got um, a ni nice impressive list there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it's growing. I don't think I have a list available anywhere online. It's it's pretty intense. I need to start working on that. I need to work on some marketing <laughs> <Yeah>. marketing stuff. <laughs> working in a little bit too much of a vacuum right now. But um, but you know it always varies. Like like Michael Jordan, they're like the the Jordan team is like, what should we make? And I'm like, well, shit, you should make a gold jump man that's rendered out of every Air Jordan ever made. And they're like, yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, do it. Do it. You know, I'm, like, <laughs> right. I'm like, all right, great. I'll, you know, and then and the next thing I know, it's being installed. Um, so there's working in that capacity, and then like the client yesterday, they already had the whole thing figured out. Yeah. And right. and they call me, and I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds great. I'm like, you're you're speaking my language. You know, this is right. exactly what I would do. Michael, um, let me let me ask a question. When you obviously 
you know, your work, you know, could be in galleries, but when did you realize the commercial value in your work that it could be used in advertising? It could be used in display spaces, public spaces. When did, is there a piece that kind of jump started that for you? Or is there, you know, when did you realize that your had your work has tremendous commercial value, especially in advertising? Yeah, definitely in advertising. Um, probably with the, the Michael Jordan piece, the, the Jordan piece that's in Chicago. It's a centerpiece of uh, Nike Town, Chicago. Mm. Um, that went up, and and I saw like you know, I mean, the Jordan brand is pretty intense. Like it's yeah, they're, they're, it's they're really serious. They're very meticulous. And so, if my work is good enough for for that caliber of a brand, I'm like, I've got my own brand. I've got my own brand essentially. Yeah. Right. Um, and. Uh, yeah, that's kind of when I realized it. And then, you know, w with all the people who were basically doing my work, um, my response to that was to name it. Like, this is perceptual art. I appropriated it because that is what I do. Like, if you read the definition of perceptual art, it describes my, my work. Yeah, so, right. again, I backwards engineered that, you know, and tried to um, unpack, like, what it is that I'm creating. And I'm like, it's perceptual art. That's mm -hmm. what I'm making. You know, so I go online and I see if perceptualart.com is available, and it is. I'm like, well, there's my brand, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's my response to people copying it, um, is to, to name it and own it and, you know. Right. Smart. Where do, you get, where, do you get, where do you get all your business knowledge from? <laughs> oh, I'm lacking in the business knowledge area. <laughs> <laughs> you probably learn on the fly a lot of it, though, but you definitely, yeah. the way that yeah. you approach it, the logo, the, you know, the branding of it, yeah, it's, it's a smart idea. It's but I think thing. it's important that our, our students particularly hear how Michael has made it his brand. You know, because we have students who, and, and really this is the whole point of what MK and I do, this whole program is to expose our students to all of these things that they don't teach you in quote unquote art school, how to file taxes, how to brand yourself, how to write patents, how to, um, you know, copyright things, how to register for things, how to write grants, like all these kinds of things that, you know, they don't put out there, but that they should be in every standard BFA program. They should have a business class. They should have legal advice. They should have all these kinds of things. So for you, Michael, to, to be able to push this brand out there basically on your own with no other understanding of it and learning on the fly, I think it's important, MK, for our kids to see how successful he's been without that background. And imagine what, how much further they could go in their careers if they do those kinds of things and take yeah. those kinds of classes, yeah. how important that is for them. The more tools you have in the toolbox. Right, you know? exactly, exactly. Yeah. exactly. So Michael, let me ask you if, you know, let's take it step-by-step step from, let's say the client contacts you, okay? Now let's say like, like Jumpman23 contacts you, Jordan's brand, and they say, we want a concept. Is it more rewarding for you to be able to do it all from scratch without any input or do you like taking the input? Does it make a difference to you? Well, I always, whenever I'm working with a client, I, you know, one of my main goals is to satisfy their, their needs. Mm, right? right. Like, so initially I try to understand what they're trying to achieve. Um, and then it's a, it's a collaborative process that, you know, that, um, that creative process of brainstorming of, of what the, the thing actually is. Um, I, you know, the, the stuff that I just come up with out of the blue and I make and install and publish, that's the best stuff, I think. Um, whenever you get too many cooks in the kitchen, things get complicated. You know, yes. you, you end up with an artwork that looks like it's designed by a committee. Yeah. I have some large, large scale public artworks that, that I won't even show you because the committee destroyed it. You know, wow. like, well, no, we need to have this flower right here. I'm like, well, that destroys the entire thing. Well, too bad, you know? And so then it's a shit artwork. I'm like, yeah, come on, yeah. guys, you know? Um, so it, it depends on who the players are, um, mm. okay. you know, who's, who's involved. Um, you know, like uh, we just did the, um, the opener for the, for the Super Bowl this year. Yeah. Um, it's this segment with all the players, like, like walking in front of the sculpture. And no, nobody really had any input at all, at all whatsoever on that. Um, you know, 
they said, I said, what's the graphic identity of the Super Bowl this year? And they said, well, it's this image right here. I said, okay. And, and you know, and they said, well, we're celebrating 100 years of the NFL. I said, okay, well, what's the graphic identity for that? They gave me that. I was like, well, this is perfect. These are your two illusions. And then it explodes and we see a mural of the 100 years of the NFL. Um, so you don't actually see it on the, um, there's one video that shows the backside, which is a mural of 100 years of the NFL. Mm. Um, and that right. wasn't actually shown on TV because the budget got cut. So oh, the, really? Huh. So the train, train track that goes around the sculpture got, got cut with the budget, so the camera couldn't go around the back of the artwork. But it's this whole other thing wow. on the backside, which is really cool. And they really had no input. Like I, like I made the model, and they're like, yeah, it's perfect. I'm like, okay, great. I was like, well, what if we do this? <laughs> they're like, oh, that's perfect. I'm like, all right. Uh, so I just kept going like that, and nobody ever right. really – you know, weighed in on creative direction or anything. They're like, well, that's your job. You know, that, right. that's why people hire me. Yeah. They want me right. to tell them what it should look like. Wait, right. And I'm happy, right. which I'm happy to do. Yeah. yeah. Has there ever been a time with a client where you've had to step off of the job because it was just, there was just too much going on to not your liking or, or somebody offering information or demanding things that you were just like, nah, this isn't going to work. No, not, not really. Um, you know, I'm a team player. Like, um, right. you know, sometimes I just make the, make the design and someone else makes it. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes someone else comes up with the design and then I make it. Uh, I really, you know, it's fun. It's, um, it's a fun relationship to have with somebody or with some other team. And um, I always enjoy it in, in all of its capacities. So, yeah. no, no, not really. That's interesting. And, um, it's interesting. I'm, it's, what it's, I'm, actually, I'm actually pretty easy to work with. Um, which is what I hear. From I'm sure that's why you've had so many clients. That's a good thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're batting whatever that is in baseball. That's really good. Um, we have hundred percent satisfaction. I've never had an, an un, unhappy client. Um, that's great. Like might get a phone call when this goes out, but um, <laughs> I don't think I've ever had an unhappy client. Um, yeah. It's always a good time. It's always fun. You know, we so, do yeah. like, you know, I decided early on that like, like I thought I wanted to be an architect and I'm like, no, I want to make the coolest thing inside the building. Like the jewel, yeah, know, the, yeah. The, right. the heart of the building, you know, like that's what I want to make. Um, and that's kind of what we do. Like we, you know, there's always like one thing in a building that we, you know, when we put an artwork up, it's like, it's not like anything else in the building. It's awesome because especially to nowadays, everything is so experience based for people. They want to go yeah. out. They want to have an experience. They want to see things. They want to post it to the social media. And your work just works so well for all that. And yeah, I love, yeah. I love, I love the way that you say that about like the, the, the focal point or the heart of the building. It's, it's interesting, yeah. My work is kind of a, a response to that, that, that need for interaction, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, so much of the stuff that we experience is on a flat screen. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make like kind of that computer generated experience, but in real life. Yeah. So yeah. You, so when you see these things in person, like you see CGI all the time, you know, but like a practical effect in a movie is totally different than like some computer generated garbage, you know? Right. And, and that's how these objects are. They're, they're like practical effects. Yeah. I love special, that. Special Cause when, when I, when I see your work, I think of, you know, I, I do a little bit of 3d design. Um, I do teach a 3d design course to like sixth and seventh graders in the summer. And we use Google sketchup, like the very beginning program. And like when they design their work three dimensionally, we use like the camera and you pan around to see it from all different sides or like the orbit tool to look all around. And whenever I see your work, I always think about that. And when, when you say it, that it's, you know, taking that CGI kind of and making it into reality, I, I, I totally get it. And when yeah. going back to the NFL piece, um, like in that, if for that particular format where it's something that they're going to put in their promote promos or during the game when they have the stats of the player, you know, it could have very easily just been done CGI. But I, yeah. I give I give the NFL a lot of credit for for going at it with this approach. You know, yeah. totally. I think yeah, there's really there's cool. there's something to be said about that tactile experience that the reality of it is is the draw in. And I think for, for all intents and purposes, and I'm not trying to make it sound old, but I think it comes with a certain time period. Like we know what movies were like without CGI. Like we know what things were like when they, were ha when they had to be done analog by hand. Like MK, I think back to like our interview with Say Adams earlier in this program where everything was 
you know, back in the day, even for graphic design, was all done with tracing paper and light boxes and yeah. sending things out to the printer to get a proof and then have it come back. And like, for those of us that came up through those generations, we value that still and we respect it and we enjoy it right. more so than, ah, we'll just program it and throw it up on a computer and figure out an algorithm and the, and the computer will do it for us. Yeah. Right. Right. You know? Michael, do you think that your background in construction and being hands-on informs you to, to go that way no matter what, that that's what's, what's so enjoyable about it? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Uh, like, I'm using computers right now to, to recreate a process that I started doing with my hands in a ball of clay. Right. You know, um, I'm not I, – I didn't abandon the ball of clay and that whole technique. I'm trying to add other tools into the equation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think about um, like with all the online learning, you know, I used to teach at a university and I never wanted to teach online. Um, it was something that I always resisted because I really like that contact, you know, of being right. in a classroom and, and, and actually making the real things. Yeah. I think about like how, you know, with this pandemic, everybody's going to be moving to online classes. Like, how do you teach mold making yeah, uh, right. through Zoom, through Zoom? Right. You know, I mean, there's so many little, little there's nuances details. and all kinds of yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, like, you know, if, if this is going to be the new normal, like what what is the end product going to be with those students and those craftspeople? Uh, we've who... seen the end product and it yes. is not good, Michael. It is not good. No, yeah. it is not. And I, think, <laughs> I think we have I think we have a a legitimate concern about like what you said about the loss of craftsmanship. I think craftsmanship is such an important part and it's underrated and not discussed as much as it should be mm, in the right. art world that yeah, everybody right. wants to make a quick buck. Everybody wants to do it the quickest and the easiest and, and reap the benefits from it and not think through the process or not think through the whole point of what it means to be a creative person and get your hands dirty and get it in there and, and physically create. And that's why I think we have such a huge admiration for what you do, Michael, because it's on the surface, it's very, like MK said, it's very, you know, virtual and digital in its appearance, but the creative part, the creation and the physical piece is all analog, old school, you know, getting up to your elbows dirty and figuring it out. And that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I like you know, it's interesting. One of oh. one of our pieces um, that we did was was for Toyota, um, but it was like one of my processes. It was the expanded graphic process where we take a, a graphic image and we explode it in three dimensional space. Um, we, we did it very little creative input from the client, so I had like total control um, over the space, the lighting, the object, and and I filmed it. You know, and uh, every time I finish a big project, I buy a new piece of gear. So every project I do, the end results look better. And we, we created this artwork and, and I filmed it and edited it and published it and it looked digital. Mm. And it was just dead. And like, like, you know, I mean, I'll be completely honest. I'm trying to impress people. I'm trying to impress my wife. I'm still trying to impress my mother. You know, I'm like, ah, oh, check this out, what I made. You know, like, like right. a little kid, like show and tell. That's drive. That's um, so important to have. Yeah, it, it's rewarding. You know, yeah. and when I see people look at the work and they're like, oh my gosh, and they have this great experience, that's really special to me. That's the yeah, thing we right. just. That's what we just made. We made that experience that that person had. But this piece, like, look, it was so well refined that it looked digital, and it's like that's interesting. It might as well have been digital. You know, right. like all that work, you know, so, so it was almost too clean, you know, if there had right. been like, you want a fine line of that, you want to see, you don't want it to be too perfect, but you want it to right. be perfect. It's yeah, exactly. That's exactly. interesting. Yeah. Well, I think, then it just it, I think, digital. yeah, I think it goes back to any artist wanting people to know that they made it. Like you physically yeah. had the ability. And like you said, Michael, like it brings attention to your talent. Like you yeah. have been given a talent that you want to share, but at the same time, you want to be recognized for the labor that you've put into it and the time that you spent and the talent that goes and the hard work that goes into that. We've talked about that on previous episodes too, about 
putting in the effort and the time. And I can see you're just like, yeah, oh my God, the effort. Like nobody understands the effort. Well, I want the client to value all that. Uh, really at the end of the day, like for me, the work isn't anything about me. Um, right. You know, like uh, it's about the experience that the person has. That's what it's right. all about. Um, right. Whether or not, you know, uh, it doesn't rep- I mean, it represents me, but like, that's not what I'm in it for. Mm, you right. know, it's for the other people. Um, yeah. But I want my clients to feel that way. I want them to be impressed and, you know, right. the handmade, all that. Yeah. Um, how, much, how important is it, this will segue into, how is important is it to you to see yourself as a communicator, as an artist? Because a lot of the work that you do has a message to it, especially like lately. It's, it's been, you know, it, it has social justice issues and political issues. And I mean, is that an important part of your identity as your brand of an artist is to take on this communication with people? Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely clear communication is really important to me. Um, but more so than communicating a message, I, um, I'm trying to create artworks that are a critical foil that, mm. that reflect the world around them. Mm. Um, like the, like the piece I just published last week, um, infinite war, it's an infinity symbol on one side, the word war on the other side, and then it's right. wallpapered with the names of all the military industrial complex contractors. Right. So it's kind of an infographic. It's not really me making so much of a statement as I am reflecting the current situation. Right. Um, right. The United States is engaged in endless war. And that's what this piece is about. And these are all those companies that make that possible. These are all right. the companies that are that are profiting from that that endless warfare. Right. Um, so, so you feel that like you, you're bringing light to to people to to be aware of things holding a mirror up to right. uh, things you know right. the the guns in the united states that was really i wasn't trying to make a, a specific statement about guns other than maybe there's a lot of guns in the united states um right. but i was just kind of reflecting a situation like wow the united states is obsessed with guns like there's something right. going on the united states right. equates the second amendment with guns which is crazy like guns don't represent freedom guns right. are made to to take lives that's what right. they're for um right. they're not to give you freedom um, right. yeah this piece is a war machine and it's um in a similar vein as endless war but this is about how you know war is um is a you know thing that the united states uses for for profit mm, so wow. there's all these all these objects inside there like tanks and guns and bullets and soldiers and and all of the propaganda that's put out by the Pentagon, like images from movies that are funded by the Pentagon, like King Kong and Star Wars. It's crazy how much of our entertainment is actually created by the Pentagon. Um, and it's just to get people thinking that war is cool, that soldiers right. are cool, that violence is cool. Mm. Um, and it's not, <laughs> you know. Yeah, um, yeah. Wow. That's it's crazy. Just, it's, it's so admirable to see you take your work to a level that does that, 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 like you said, that holds the mirror up. It takes a lot of resilience and fortitude for an artist to put forth that and say, you know what, this is, and I was talking to MK about it earlier before we logged on. Like I was so impressed by one of your posts, a couple of, it was either last week or a couple of weeks ago, how you showed um, one of the protests going on in Brooklyn where you currently reside and you and was just holding up like a Black Lives Matter uh, protest. And I noticed somebody made a comment like, hey, how about you just show us your artwork? That's what we're here for. And you just straight out came like, don't follow me then, bro. Like, yeah, totally. I, yeah. I love that about like your whole attitude is just, this is what I'm putting out. And if you don't like it, don't follow me. Don't like it back. Yeah, and a lot a lot of people don't like the political stuff. I hear a lot of times like, oh, why does you know why does art have to be political? Uh, you know, say that to me. I'm like, well, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in politics that right. needs to be talked about. You know, and this right. is my this way is of way communicating. Of right. Yeah, my my way of introducing ideas. Like really, like what I, I'm often trying to do is just stimulate conversation and get people talking about things and and expressing their their, their feelings about things, like the whole gun thing. Everybody in my family has told me how they feel about guns. We've had all these conversations about guns. And that's great because when people discuss things outside of the, their own, like, you know, little meat box, they, um, they think about things differently. 
Like, right. like if I tell you how I feel about guns, I'm going to hear myself saying, and be like, is that really what I think? You know, yeah. I've, exter- I've externalized it and now it's real and it's tangible. I, I've got, you know, I'm dealing with, you know, people's reaction to, to my thoughts and what I've said. It's not just locked inside my brain. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of times that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to stimulate conversation. I'm not, and that's what art should do, you know, definitely. Hopefully. Yeah, it can. It's one of yeah. the things it can do. Michael, how important it is for you, for your, to be able to have that outlet as an artist, like, do you feel like that helps you get your own personal feelings about things, no matter what the issue is? Like you can say, Hey, I'm just going to pour it into this piece. Uh, a lot of times, um, the, the artwork is the result of me pondering on something. It's the way that I deal with things, the way that I process information. Black Lives Matter, um, I just did a Black Lives Matter sculpture, and it, it's a, um, it's a, all these little like images of, of all of the men and women who have uh, lost their lives to law enforcement right. for reasons that were believed to be race-related. Um, so it's all their images and it says black on one side and it says lives on the other side that matter on the, on the back. Um, and like in my studio, we went through all of those photos and we went through everybody's story. You know, we got really engaged in, in the entire narrative and it was a way for us to deal with it and, and cope with it and right. learn more about it. Now, a lot of the stuff I work on are investigations like the, the, the infinite war piece. Um, the infinite war piece is, uh, you know, we had to do a lot of research to, to figure out, well, who, who are the military contractors that are making all this money from, from war, um, right. you know, and, and really do a deep dive into that. Um, right. and, and it's exciting because we, every, every project I do, my team and I do, we learn a lot. I learn a lot yeah. mm. at least, um, you know, like I know every one of those people's names, like, you know, yeah. typically, typically the parts in our sculptures, they're, they're one and two and three and four. But, you know, this one, uh, part number one is Brianna Taylor. You know, part right. number two is George Floyd. You know, we made right. sure that we use their names as the, the names of the files so that we right. can develop that relationship to the, to the person. That's incredible. Right. It's just, it's, it's very, it sounds very therapeutic for you in a way. Like for, uh, and, and I think for our students to know that art is a way to work out issues that they have with themselves we always you know mk and i always like to joke that um the, the art room the high school art room is the island of misfit toys like we get the kids who don't always fit in in everything else like may, maybe they're not athletes maybe they're not ac- academically inclined maybe they they feel lost in the building they don't yeah. have a lot of social contacts and yet they find themselves coming into the art room and feeling a part of something and there's something about when they create that everything that they've built up in their head that they've internalized has the option to come out safely for them. Yeah. Yeah. And you really can't help it. Um, you right. know, when you make something, it's going to reflect your, you know, what's going on in your head. Um, right. A lot of time. Very cool. MK, we are well over an hour yeah. as usual. That's great. Like just unbelievable to get to talk to this gentleman and get inside his head and, just discuss the beauty of what he does. And it's like we said, it's so unique, Michael. Yeah. And it's, it's just so impressive. And we really hope to see you just continue to evolve with it. Cause it's just been such a cool ride. Like I've been following, I think I've been following his work. Long for, time. Yeah. Were, like, we've been talking about it for a while. We've been talking about Michael for a long time. We, we finally, like I finally reached out to him and, and got him to answer back. And I told him, Kenny, he's like, that's awesome. We got to get him yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's sweet. Like, and, and he's been Appreciate so open and so, uh, so gracious with, with giving us, you know, his time and his information. So Michael, I want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts, both MK and I, it's just been a great experience getting to know you. Yeah. We learned a lot. I learned a lot. Yeah. Through the pre-check and and messaging you back and forth and texting you on the phone and just, just a great experience. Thank you so much. for students are going to enjoy it too. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you for the opportunity. No, no absolutely. No Thank you so much. Everybody, uh, again, we're on a bi-weekly schedule, so we'll be off next week. But after that, we'll be heading into August, MK. It's getting it. uh, into getting the dog close. days, my friend. Getting close. We're getting close. Uh-huh. We're keeping our fingers crossed. We'll see what kind of announcements come down the pipe. But until then, everybody, keep looking out for one another. Keep loving one another. Stay connected. Uh, we'll be getting through things little by little. 
yeah. and new normal, regular normal, whatever it is, we'll make it work. So God bless right. everybody. We'll uh, yep. we'll talk to everybody soon. All right. Thank you, Take Michael. Care. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Have a great day.